All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Conley, uh, coming to you live from Library Love Fest here at HarperCollins Publishers. Uh, again, I work for the library marketing team, and I'm here with quite an author. Uh, Willie Vlaughton, author of uh, what, five novels now, including Don't Skip Out on Me, which actually just goes on sale today. Uh, Willie, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, and this is a novel, I actually first read this, and then I went back and read your backlist over the span of <laughs> like a week or so, because it won me over. And I, I, I have to tell you, like, so um, I read this novel, it completely this, it just took over my mind for an entire night, and I started telling librarians about this. And the reads I'm getting from librarians are crazy. Like cr I, I've never gotten a response from librarians when when I send them books like this. Um, there's a lot of love. I just want to read one or two. Um, let's see. Janet Lockhart uh, says the prose slips through your mind like silk slips through your fingers. Our friend Robin Bierbauer, who yeah, you know, she's uh, <laughs> classic librarian. Classic librarian. Yeah. She's awesome. I fell in love with his gorgeous writing and razor sharp characterizations all over again. Um, it's unreal. And uh, so I don't know if you just want to give a brief overview of the book and how it came to be. I mean, it's set in central Nevada uh, and Arizona, Tucson, but, but both of which, just because I, I love those areas, and yep. one of the great things about writing novels, you can set it any place you want to live. But I was interested in uh, b broken people. Like the, It's easy to break a kid, um, and then once they're broken, it's so hard to fix them as adults. And, and, and the novel's really a, about that. It's about a, a, a kid who, who was raised to be ashamed of himself um, and uh, by 14 ends up living with a ranch family, the, an old couple who, who love him and they want to give everything they have to him, both spiritually, monetarily. But he was raised so, so kind of dented and beat up that he can't accept it, their offer. And so he, he feels like he's got to prove himself before, uh, before he can come back and take the ranch that idea of to, to accept love you um, you have to be a great man or do mm -hmm. something great and so his idea is he's part Native American and part uh, white and he decides that uh, and he's been ashamed of that he was raised to be ashamed of that that he uh, decides he's going to become Mexican and become a Mexican boxer because he thinks Mexican boxers are the toughest and they're never scared and I think that's, I mean, your characters throughout your books, The Motel Life, Lean on Pete, I mean, they all deal with characters who are in some way broken or have gone through a tragedy, things of that nature. Horus in particular, though, I think is dealing in kind of a unique situation because it is that kind of identity issue where, yeah, there's no, there's no good Indian boxers, which is such a tragic kind of form of self-hate. And I feel like that's slightly new territory for you dealing with, with that specific subject matter. Is that something, like how did that come to be and why did you want to well, Yeah, I mean, that? I think even though there are great uh, Native American boxers, he, he wants to be something else. I mean, as a young guy, I just wanted to be, uh, I wanted to be some, anybody else but me. Yeah. And I kept thinking there had to be, I'd find a box addict that, that would tell the real family I was with or like the reason I was me. And then I was the guy that would think that, like, well, maybe if you could change your identity, if you moved to a different country and just started acting like you were from that country, maybe all your problems would go away. Yeah. You know, maybe the things that, the weight on your back would go away if, you, if there was a magic pill. Mm -hmm. and, and for a horse, the magic pill is I'm going to become a Mexican boxer because he respects it and he respects the idea of it. Uh, I, I was like that in my, in my own way. Uh, and, and so... It, 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 as different as he is, I mean, it's probably one of the closest to me uh, of a character. You know? And I mean, I know this. So again, so you're the front, you were the front man for Richmond Fontaine, which was around for what, 22 years yeah. almost, uh, lead s singer songwriter, and now you're with uh, the Lions. Um, but this novel shares the same title with a song that you wrote, uh, "Don't Skip Out on Me." And I'm wondering, like, with your mind, how does story and music kind of share the space? In, in your mind, and where, where did it start as far as, did Horace come along with that song? Yeah, you know, I mean, all my novels started as songs, and, you know, I wrote songs from when I was 12, like, obsessively, kind of, horrible songs, but I was trying to write, like, country hits, and I didn't have, I'm not witty, like, I couldn't come up with the one-liners, and then when I started writing stories about 18, all my songs became eight-minute-long folk songs that were even worse because they weren't catchy 
So they they kind of got married about 18, where my stories and my songs were very similar. And then, so the Motel Life, North Line, the free Lean on Pete all started as songs. And, um, and with this one, I was kind of thinking about the ideas of Don't Skip Out on Me. And, um, and then eventually I wrote that song. I was about 20 pages into Don't Skip Out on Me and wrote the song Don't Skip Out on Me, which, although the story of the song is different, I think it feels, it feels like the novel's dipped inside the sadness mm -hmm. of that song. Um, and so when it came to a title, I thought, you know, if, if you could put the book inside a song, I think it would be that song. Um, and so they're, they're married like that. They're, I always say they're, they're kind of like they, they live in, a, um, in the same apartment building, the songs <laughs> and stories, you know. Apartment building. I think of the characters and, you know, like the motel life. And whenever I drive by a motel now, I, I think about, you know, who is occupying those spaces. And, and that's something you've mentioned in a past interview. It's the quote um, by Ian McLaren. Be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle, and you know, and seeing people through kind eyes, which is at times I think hard in your novels because you come across people that they trust. I think of uh, Charlie and Lean on Pete and uh, how he meets. Uh, gosh, and now I'm forgetting the name of the the, the guy who uh, Silver. Yeah. Who you know, yeah. it, there's there's trust involved there and the kindness of strangers, but also life throws you some punches and and you can feel betrayed. I'm curious, like. How you how you keep up that kind of sense of hope amidst all this hardship because that's really what these people are dealing with. Yeah, well, say for Charlie and Lean on Pete, I think uh, he does meet you know a lot of people in that novel, and some are kind. Uh, I mean, in my own life, and maybe it's being in you know a small time band for so long. I mean, we we are always kind of like a, a duct tape, struggling band, and the kindness of people. Mm -hmm. I'd never experienced in my life like people who let you stay at their house, feed you, um, uh, make you lunches for the next day, that kind of stuff. It's real, and I never knew it was real until then. But you also meet the lower yard of the ground, like Charlie, he's living pretty close to the bottom. And so when, you, when you're living hard, you meet hard people. Mm -hmm. And so guys like Silver are there, and they are, and they are there for real. I mean, in life, like when you're struggling and you're around struggling people, uh, desperation is can be brutal. Um, and and Charlie gets kind of swept up in kind of a a rough char charismatic silver, and mm -hmm. silver's mentally ill and, and and a rough guy. And uh, and Charlie pays the price a little bit for it. Mm -hmm. um, but you do meet people like that as well as as as, as the kindness of strangers as well. So it, it's life. Life can be rough if you're mm -hmm. if you're alone, and I think that in in Lean on Pete, I was thinking about that a lot. And I, I mean, I noticed some of the stranger not strangers, but you know, Horace is traveling down eventually to Mexico, Mexico to become this champion championship boxer, and he's staying with his aunt, who, you know, doesn't really do him any favors as far as feeling wanted or loved or you know all the things that he's really lacking in his life. Um, but there's hints of it, and I think. With your characters, no one's 100% one thing. Like they're they're not caricatures. They're they're real people, and I can tell that with the aunt as well, because you can tell she. You, you give her an ounce of humanity, and I mean, it would be lucky if people were black and white. Like, so if, if a bad person's bad, then you're like mm -hmm. they're bad. I mean, the, mo the the most devastating bad people are like 60% uh, nice, 40% bad, or 50-50. You know, it's like an abusive, abusive man. Say, uh, is probably really nice because he's got to make up for when he's bad. So some of the most suave people have done the worst things because they've had to uh, navigate that. So how do you navigate it? You learn how to be really nice to make up for when you were bad. Um, so yeah, even the aunt who has nothing to do again with Horace, um, but she had a fallen out with her sister. And she doesn't know Horace, and she doesn't know why her sister said, "Hey, can you can you let my son live with you?" Um, so she's wary of him, but she kind of likes him because he's a good kid. Yeah. But she also got her own baggage, so you don't really know her, why she is the way she is. But it, obviously, it affects Horace and 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 that kind of distant uh, distrust of him um, without even knowing him is, yeah. is hard is hard on the kid. And speaking of the aunt's backstory, I think that's something I really love about your characters that they could be in a paragraph a page doesn't really matter how much screen time they have there's you can tell they have this backstory this huge backstory and you really give a lot of humanity and, and truth to these characters again no matter how much time they spend on the page which i love like uh, that's nice you to say yeah of course. i mean i, I th 
the thing with me is I write these things for years. They're they're small books, yeah. uh, but I edit. I maybe edited that for a couple of years, mm -hmm. you know. So and it was a big, burly novel before <laughs> it got in the shape it's in. So yeah. So I, I know who these people are. Usually, yeah. usually I did. I wrote their story and it just didn't work. It work in the novel, so I had to mm -hmm. cut it out. So yeah. I know, and I know that Ant Man. I've, yeah. I mean, I've stayed at those kind of people's houses where. Yeah. Where relatives houses where you you know you're not really wanted uh, and it has nothing to do with you, yeah. but you you don't you don't understand it because you're a kid or you're just naive or what. Yeah. But I mean I know I know you cut you may, like you said you cut all these pages, but you can still feel I mean those pages don't go away obviously because they're still there in the character and I think readers can really feel that. Um, and again, anyone watching, if you have questions, let us know and uh, we'll try to get a few to answered. Um, I do want to talk a little bit just about traveling, and uh, this is a question actually from Lillian Dabney. She's at the Seattle Public Library, one of your newfound fans, uh, and again, of which there are now many. Uh, and she wanted to talk kind of about your author schedule versus your music travel and kind of like how those compare, because it seems like you take to the road often and aggressively, you might say. I mean, with a band, it's kind of... I don't know if you have to travel a lot as a band, but we always did. We were from the that old school idea of, of getting in the van. And we didn't tour half as much as like Friends of Ours bands, but we toured a lot um, out of you know promotion, but also it was just fun. You, and you get to be a band, you get to work, and you know we got lucky and got to play in Europe a lot, and which none of us had passports before Fontaine, or at least one guy did. Uh, so we took, a, we traveled a lot just to see things. Mm. With with a book, it's like I always think of of like "Don't Skip Out of Me" is like my favorite. It'd be like your favorite dog. You put your favorite dog or something that you love, and you put it in a little rowboat, and you drop it in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and you say, "Good luck, man. I hope you find a home somewhere." <laughs> yeah. So, and that just hurts me to think of him out there alone. Yeah. And uh, and so by touring, I always feel like, well, you know, I'm giving him, a, you know, life raft, some food. Hopefully, I'm introducing him to some people. Maybe he'll find some some home out there in the world. Yeah. So by t touring the the book, I uh, I feel like I'm giving it a shot. I'm mm -hmm. I'm 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 doing the hard work for for the book, and um, the books are my pals. I love I love them, and so uh, that's why I t t tour tour books. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and speaking of kind of touring, because I know you do a lot of stuff in Europe too. And when I read your books, I mean, I I think of America, at least America that that I, I've seen personally, maybe people on the coast don't see it as much, and I think it needs to be seen and read. Um, and I'm just curious how people abroad relate to your characters. I know you're quite popular there, and is there a difference in how people relate to your books? I mean, I think there is a, uh, part of it is uh, maybe a romanticism with the West, which um, I have as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, you know, I've spoon-fed the, the romance of the West, and I, and I lived there. Uh, I think there's some of that, I, but I think really, uh, the, I, I don't know why people like it, uh, but I, what people, they've come up to me always just, they understand the, the hard, uh, the dented people in my books, mm -hmm. I think are, are, it doesn't matter where it's set, yeah. uh, they're all the same. Um, yeah. Everybody carries their own dents and scars to them and all that, and uh, so I think maybe they relate to that as well. I'm not really sure, yeah. but, but um, I'm grateful that I get to go over there. Jesus, yeah. <laughs> um, and I guess speaking of place, so you grew up in Reno, correct? Yeah. Uh, and I know a lot of your stories take place in the Pacific Northwest. Um, this one, though, coming from Reno, and then the ranch, which is in Tonopah, correct? Yeah. Um, were you exposed growing up to kind of the sheep farmers and that whole culture and their struggles? I've read about you know the, there's a the, the part of the sheep herding stuff is a nod to a guy named uh, Robert Laxalt, a famous mm -hmm. Nevada writer, and he was really important to me because I didn't know any writers uh, from Nevada at the time. He was by far the most famous, and he wrote about uh, a lot of it was the Basque experience, the Basque American experience in northern Nevada, and I just admired him. So when I started Don't Skip Out of Me, I was pretty ragged. Uh, feeling pretty ragged, and I wanted to write about a place that brought me great comfort. And I grew up camping north of Tonopah, and I loved that area more than anything. Every summer I go to northern Nevada, central Nevada, 
uh, from Tonopah North uh, and drive around. And, and so I knew I wanted to set a story there. Um, as far as the sheep ranch, and half of it was a nod to Laxalt, um, just because I, w- I wanted to, to re- think about him when I wrote uh, this. And then also I was on a horseback riding trip, and um, I came across, a, a, in Eastern Oregon, came across a, a, a Peruvian uh, sheep herder who, whose boss left him out there alone with no food. He, wouldn't, he f- kept forgetting to drop him off food. And so the guy was on a horseback riding trip, uh, could talk to him barely through Spanish because the guy yeah. barely knew Spanish even. And, um, uh, and it was, he just said, look, he's, he hasn't shown up. I don't know what to do. And so the guy I was with was going to bring him food, but it was just this idea of being so isolated, not even barely understanding Spanish, yet alone English, and, 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 and maybe you know 70 miles from the nearest uh, store. Uh, so it was really interesting. It, it never left me that, seeing that kid. He was just a kid sleeping on a tarp, and um, so I wanted to write about that. And then that made me think of, of Laxalt and then and, and Nevada. And so part of that idea of writing it was comfort, uh, was uh, just to help me. I, I always write for I write for saints. I make Horace and the Reeses become saints to me, help me get by, and then the location. And I, you know, it's like. I just love it. Like the first two novels are set in Reno, just because I I just left Reno and I was <laughs> super homesick. So I, I set them in Reno just because I, I love Reno. You know, it's fascinating to hear these stories because they do come through. You know, in, in that young man and the loneliness he's feeling, and like from the first you know first ten pages in this book, you know that's it's isolation and it's loneliness, and how do you navigate that? And I mean, when you're touring, do you feel that, especially with a book when it's just you? Like, do you? I, I mean, touring, touring with the band is, uh, you know, I never wanted to, or not that I ever really ever thought about it, but I never wanted to be a rock star. No. I mean, I never, that never even crossed my mind. I just wanted to be in a, a band that uh, toured around, that had a van, and there was, like, we were on flyers, and we played uh, as, uh, in bars and, and got to be escape normal life and camaraderie. And so being in a band is the... the it, it's the safest place in the world in the van. The camaraderie of, of, of my band was, was all I ever wanted, and I got it. It was lucky to get such camaraderie. Um, sort of in the book stuff, like driving alone, I, I mean, again, it's easier than, uh, uh, it's easier than working. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, loneliness, I mean, Don't Skip Out of Me it is a book, kind of a study in loneliness. Um, and, they, you know, that's just, that's in my blood. I don't know if you can escape that. It's something I've always battled with. Uh, but it doesn't matter where I am. Yeah. I feel that. So driving around promoting the book. The worst thing about promoting a book is uh, you go to bookstores every day and, you, you know, you end up buying. Like a, you, by the time you get home, you have a trunk full of books. And uh, so you blow <laughs> more money on books than you, than you ever do in your normal yeah. life. So it's a bad habit. We have some questions from oh. Facebook Live. All right. All right. Martin wants to know. Are the characters that appear in your books and music the same? Yeah, the, you know, there might be variations, but like uh, I wrote a song called Laramie, Wyoming, years of uh, maybe three years before Lean on Pete, but it was the same same kid. Uh, uh, a lot of the Motel Life characters were uh, uh, songs. And then Northline, I wrote uh, a song called Northline. I wrote a song called Don't Look and It Won't Hurt and Allison Johnson all before I even really started writing the book. Uh, uh, so they're the same. They're variations, but they, they usually start kind of the roughed-out character, and then once they get in a book, they, you know, I, I, I morph them into something different because I have more time. Cool. We have a couple Thanks more. Thanks for the question. Gary wants to know, do you always write a soundtrack to your novels? No, I've only done it twice, you know. I mean, <laughs> I did it uh, for... Uh, North Line, because it was so sad that, that the woman, Allison Johnson, that w- w- was so, I related to her so much that it just, she stopped me in my tracks and I would write, the, I'd always take breaks and write these songs for her or uh, kind of soundtrack, because I always write like it's, a, like it's a movie. I always think it, it's like playing out like a movie. <laughs> um, but the other ones didn't really feel like music. And then when I started Don't Skip Out of Me by about page 10, it felt like a sad song, and um, and maybe some of the the locations of it, the, the the desolateness of it, made me think of music. And so I wrote 
over the course of three years or three and a half years of working on it, I, I wrote maybe 25, 30 instrumentals, uh, as well as a half dozen songs with lyrics. And then that one felt like, like a soundtrack. And so, so I, the, uh, Richmond Fontaine, we just kind of retired, pulled over on the side of the road. And then right when those guys get, uh, you know, used to not hearing my voice and, and are relieved not to hear me talk every day, uh, I called them up and, and, and begged them to do the, the soundtrack, and they did. And, and, and Harper's nice enough to put it, a download code, and yeah. so you get a soundtrack. It's one of our best records because it doesn't have my voice either. So, <laughs> so that's good. Uh, and the soundtrack is completely strong. I think in the comments section we have a link to the SoundCloud sampler, so you get three of the songs. I'm a completist, I believe, in a full album, though, so I do recommend get the book so you can listen from beginning to end. I listened to this in a some some darker moments in my life and it uh it, it was a good companion to me it's a beautiful stirring incredible work so i appreciate you making it yeah it was it was really fun you know we we went to a pretty fancy studio we practiced probably harder than we practiced in, in years uh for months and then we got snowed in in a freak portland snowstorm uh we got snowed in this kind of fancy studio and and knocked out the record really fast it was it, it was really really a good experience Oh. A couple more questions okay. from Allie. Willie, you've had some pretty mundane jobs. Warehouses, house painting. Do you sometimes have to pinch yourself when you see folks making movies of your novels? Yes, you know, I, I, I got to say I still break out in a cold sweat passing uh, uh, warehouses because that was the, talk about the lo probably the loneliest. House painting, uh, it wasn't so bad because I, I painted uh, uh, interiors of really rich people's houses. And I mean, being in a rich person's house all day is not the worst way to live. But I still kind of like I mildly break out in a cold sweat seeing a guy in paint clothes and go, "Please, not me." So every time I'm writing a novel and during daylight hours, like bankers' hours, when I'm when it's eleven in the morning, I'm working on a novel and not working a job I don't like. Uh, I I mean I yeah I, I pinch myself. I I I feel like I, I robbed a bank and didn't get caught. Uh, so it's lucky. It is lucky. And uh, I'm still shaking my boots. I'm going to have to go back. Yeah. All right, Dan, let's do one more before we get back to your questions. Sure. Tony asks, is it deliberate to put references to bands from your youth or your past into storylines? I don't really. I mean, and don't skip out on me. I m mentioned uh, uh, Pantera and Slayer and Metallica, Megadeth and Crowbar. But I was more, that was more because, well, the, Slayer, I, I got into for one reason. I, I bought a desk, a 1930s desk from a junk shop and um, from an old hotel from Portland, Oregon, and, and some kid had carved in <laughs> really big letters, Slayer. So every time I'm working, I see Slayer. So, you know, I, I started watching, I started going to see their concerts, and I got into Slayer a little bit. Uh, and those bands, I was always kind of like that kind of music, but... Uh, but it was more because Horace is, is so angry and lost, and, and he feels even isolated from the bands he likes because he feels like he has to be completely white to like those bands. Um, but in general, the only music I ever put in are uh, uh, like for, for, for comfort. Uh, and in the motel life, I gave the two beat up brothers the saint of Willie Nelson because I felt so bad for the brothers that their lives were so rough that I thought Willie Nelson has been a, a saint to me. He's gotten me through a lot of hard years, just his voice and uh, his greatest hits and some that will be has been a good friend to me most of my life. So I gave the brothers that. In Northline, I gave her Brenda Lee, uh, just the idea of uh, some of Brenda Lee's really beautiful ballads uh, to, to make her, help her uh, get through the night. Um, so when I write about music, it's, it's more like that. Uh, I don't intentionally ever write about rock and roll. And I, you know, I never had an interest in, in reading or writing about rock and roll. And I, I'm not really sure why, it's just, it's never interested me. All right. Uh, so yeah, just a few more questions. How are we doing on time, Amy? Are we good? I don't wanna, I don't wanna keep you longer than I want to, but I could talk for days. So um, yeah, cool. All right, so um, I did just wanna talk a little bit about uh, boxing and, and horse racing and all these kind of interests that are not mainstream interests, but they play a huge role in your books and kind of how those play in your life as well. Well, with boxing, you know, I, uh, 
I guess I you know I grew up at the tail end of where boxing was mainstream on TV, and, and I, I remember my dad. He always had, liked to watch the fights, and and he took me to some fights. Reno for a brief period of time had some big fights, and one of the big fights they had was I think in the in early '80s. It was this guy named Colin Jones, a Welsh boxer versus Milton McCroy, and it was a, a welterweight fight, and it was the first championship, like world championship in Reno, and you know like. Like 70, 80 years or something, I think, and uh, and I just remember reading about Colin Jones because he was a you know a, a a Welsh guy that dug graves for a living. He would run five miles and then dig graves by hand with a shovel all day long, and then run five miles home and then work out. And I you know I was a sad sack guy that just you know was thirteen listening to records and writing super sad sack horrible songs, but late at night I go. I'd put on my Yes records or, you know, whatever I was listening to. I was listening to a lot of Yes and Rush back then, and I would go, I'm going to be I'm gonna be Colin Jones. I'm going to be that tough. Now, I didn't want to fight or get hit, but I wanted to be him, that tough. And so I started uh, subscribing to The Ring magazine, and, and what I found is that I love the tragedy of boxing stories, and each month's issue there would be the life history of a boxer. And the stories are all so rough. So many of them are so rough and so tragic, but I never got tired of them. I mean, what, that says something about me. It does. <laughs> but I loved the, the tragedy of the boxing stories. So I always followed it that way. Horse racing, I got into just because, I, you know, I used to gamble. I, a few times I gambled paychecks away in Reno when I lived there because you, you could cash your paycheck at a casino, and then they'd give you free breakfast and 12 free drinks. And then, but then you'd have your what I, you know, I was making like two hundred and thirty bucks a month a week, and uh, uh, and so you'd have two, uh, you know, over two hundred bucks in your pocket and free, twelve free drinks. So I, so I lost my paycheck a couple times, and I was so ashamed of myself for losing the paycheck that I, I just said, well, I'm gonna just bet horses, and then I'm gonna only bet twenty dollars at a time, a day, and uh, and then I got addicted to it, and then I loved it, the handicap and races. And then when I moved to Portland, I was so homesick for, for Reno and, and so misplaced in, in Portland that I didn't know what to do, and I, I was going to move home. And then I found Portland Meadows, the racetrack, and I was like, well, this feels like Reno, and I'll just hang out here every time I want to move home. And, uh, and I did. I hung out there for 15 years, wrote uh, North Line there, wrote Half a Lean on Pete and a couple failed novels there. And um, it was my favorite thing. And my problem with horse racing is I just fell in love with horses and jockeys. And you can't fall in love with anything uh, that way at a track. And so I started getting these huge crushes on horses. And then you'd see the horses either get hurt or killed or, or just sold off. And, uh, and it was just too much for me. I just couldn't take it. So I, uh, uh, so I, I, I had to leave horse racing. Horse racing me broke up. Because because I, I would I would have owned a hundred race horses and I don't know I didn't know anything about horses then uh, uh, so I so I broke up and finished Lean on Pete and Lean on Pete's about about that about the the rougher side of horse racing and you know I think maybe this is part of the reason why people connect with your novels so much it seems and correct me if I'm wrong but you you write them for you and you alone and I don't know maybe every writer does but for you it seems like you're really taking your life and what you've dealt with and you're putting it into a book and it's for you first and foremost I mean is that right yeah you know I don't write autobiographical stuff so much like if I do n no one except maybe my brother and uh, a few people would know uh, what it, what I was talking yeah. about because I mask it all I, I, I never had an intention to write memoir or, or hurt anybody with my books but uh, but they bring me great comfort. I never, in motel life, I never thought I'd publish it. I didn't, I didn't, I wrote novels for 15 years before I even showed anybody because I didn't want anyone to say I was bad at it because I liked it so much. So yeah, I'll write about, uh, uh, you know, the motel life is like a study in self-defeat about two kind of flailing brothers. Uh, but I wanted to live in a world where two brothers never fought and I wanted to, and I wanted to live in a world where two guys had to try to be better than they were and they struggled. And so I wrote that just because I was struggling with that. Same with North Line. Same North Line's like a, a study in weakness. Uh, you know, she's the saint of weakness, uh, Allison Johnson, and the pain and, and the trouble you get into by being weak. And I was struggling with all that stuff. And then my horse racing book about my you know 
loving horses too much to bet on them. And then the free is kind of my State of the Union address. So, you know, I, I went through this phase where I thought I was going to get hit by a car or truck, and, 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 and I hadn't written about a nurse yet. And, and I've always loved nurses. I've always had a thing for nurses. And, uh, and so I had to write uh, about health care and, and nurses uh, uh, for me. Yeah, so, yeah, they, they all start just, for, I, you know, I believe in saints, and, and I, I, I create saints to get me through. Yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, I think, once, for me at least, you know, once you, once you get to around your 30s, you know, you have your favorite things kind of pretty much set in your life. You have your, you have your best friends, and you have your favorite books, and your favorite authors, your favorite music, and that's, usually it doesn't change. And I, I just want to say right off the bat, you know, I, I read this, and... I knew from that moment once I read your other stuff, like I had found my new favorite living author, like, and I, I, I'm getting that reaction from other people too. So I just want to thank you for. Well, that's a really nice thing to say, man. No, it's. I, I, I appreciate that. You don't get to find your new favorite things very often, so yeah. it's a, uh, it's a special experience. And um, for everyone watching, I guess, I, I, I think if if you're willing, uh, maybe we can listen to you play a little bit, and that'd be maybe a good way to end it off, and uh, some people on their merry way. Right. And uh, if you could just let us know what you're going to play. And, uh, well, I'll play the, the song uh, Don't Skip Out on Me, uh, um, which inspired the novel. And you'll know, uh, you'll, once you hear me singing, you'll know why, uh, why Richard Fontaine was never famous. <laughs>
love don't skip out on Well, <laughs> thank you, Willie, for joining me today. Sorry you had to sit right next to me, Mom. No, I'm, that, gosh, yeah. oh, damn, I'm not. Thank you very much for playing. Um, so don't skip out on me. It's on sale today. Uh, go out, discover your new favorite author. Um, it's a real special experience. And uh, thanks again for joining us. This is Chris Conley with Library Love Fest. Thanks. <laughs>